uh, who is a professor since uh, two years ago, three years ago in OASP in Okinawa, which is um, for those who you don't know, it's a wonderful place in Japan. <laughs> he can tell you about it. It's a tropical island. <laughs> And uh, he will talk today about uh, thermodynamics of error correction, which was a very famous work of him uh, from a few years ago. So I leave the space to Simone. Okay, uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, so um, today I will tell you a bit about our work on uh, error correction in biology. And I'll try to give a bit of an overview of the things we have been doing a few years ago. And then in the second part of my talk, I'll tell you about some more recent work. So uh, just to introduce the subject, um, there are uh, several fundamental processes in biology that fundamentally deal with the idea of copying information. So of course, everything related with the central dogma, um, replication of DNA, transcription of genes, and finally, translation of, uh, of RNA into proteins. These three processes can be seen from a physical information point of view as processes in which there is some information encoded in a polymer and some uh, uh, biological enzymes uh, needs to replicate this information into another polymer. So one aspect I will focus on in this talk uh, is the accuracy of this mechanism. So in particular, the typical um, values of the accuracy in these three processes is, uh, is what you see in the slide. So transcription and translation uh, have an accuracy of about 10 to the minus 4, so one error every 10 to the 4 um, monomers, whereas the DNA replication is a much more accurate process, uh, so that the, there will be an error on average every 1 billion monomers. So of course, uh, um, these numbers are not absolute values, so they, they can vary a bit um, according to the conditions and they are not exactly the same in different organisms. You can think of them as somehow they can be one order of magnitude more or less, but still um, um, these numbers are very, very small. And of course, as usual in physics, when we think about the small number, the question we should ask is small compared to what? And, uh, and to just give you an idea, if you think about the possibly simplest uh, model of replication of information, which is the Michaelis mental model, in which you have an enzyme that can bind to either uh, right and wrong uh, monomers to form a bound state, and this bound state is finally transformed into a product. Uh, if you do the math, you'll find out that the error rate um, is always larger than a limit, which is given by the Boltzmann factor. So the difference in uh, e to the minus beta times the difference in free energy between a right and a wrong incorporated monomers. So there are two considerations here to be made. One is that uh, you reach this limit when the operation is performed infinitely slow, which is clearly not the case in biology. And the second important consideration is that it's pretty easy to put numbers on these expressions. So we know that uh, KBT is about 2.5 kilojoule per mole. Delta G in the case of um, DNA replication can be measured in a relatively easy way. And uh, it's in the range of one to 16 kilojoule per mole, depending on the pair of monomers that is considered. And so you will get that the minimum error is um, something not smaller than 10 to the minus two, which is clearly incompatible with 10 to the minus nine, which is the observed value. So the solution to this paradox is, uh, um, is the idea of proofreading. So this is um, an image from an old picture from the stock market where um, information on a tape which contains financial data um, is controlled by several people because clearly this is something that you need to read correctly. And you can think that this is pretty similar to what uh, is, is done by biological systems. So if you look at the details of reactions, for example, that lead to the incorporation of codons in translation, these are not simple reactions, but they are uh, complex reactions that occur in many consecutive steps. And at different stages of these reactions, there are checkpoints. So st 
stages where um, if a wrong in, uh, monomer is attempted to be incorporated, this wrong monomer can be ejected and the reaction can be started again. So again, if you think of this from a physical perspective, it is clear that these reactions have to occur out of equilibrium because if you operate close to thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, no matter how complex the reaction is, uh, in the end, you will end up with a, a population that is weighted by the Boltzmann factor. And so you will end up with the same results as before, even if the network is more complex. So uh, the idea I want to introduce here is that to achieve error correction, you need uh, some combination of a complex incorporation network and uh, driving out of equilibrium. So you need to spend energy. Um, it's, it's always a bit awkward to give talks on Zoom, so please interrupt me at any time if something is unclear or if there are questions. I'll, I'll be happy if the talk is informal. Um, so one of the first concrete models of proofreading was proposed by Hopfield in the 70s in a very influential paper, and he proposed a possible mechanism for error correction, and this is a, a relatively simple generalization of the intelligent model in which uh, uh, regardless of whether a right or a wrong monomer is incorporated, uh, the reaction has an extra step. So this is an irreversible step in which the uh, bound state is brought to a high energy state. And this reaction is um, um, insensitive of the, of the monomer. So here in this figure, I, the, the black arrows are rates that are the same for right and wrong monomers. Uh, and uh, and the blue and the light blue arrows are specific reactions. So if you think of this uh, scheme in terms of an energy landscape, uh, it, this is uh, the figure in the bottom. So you have a, a difference in uh, free energy between the right and the wrong monomer, and this difference is kept the same after transformation into a high energy state because the reaction is uh, is uh, the, the rate is uh, is equal for right and wrong monomers. So the fact that there is this irreversible reaction essentially permits to uh, discriminate twice. So you can have unbinding, preferential unbinding of the wrong monomer after the first step, and another preferential unbinding of the wrong monomer after the second step. So this already brings the error from e to the minus beta delta g to e to the minus beta delta g squared. So if the minimum error was 10 to the minus two, adding this mechanism, you get 10 to the minus four. Um, so this, this uh, is, um, is an idea that has a lot of influence in biology. It, it also has shown that you don't need to uh, discriminate in the non-equilibrium step. So you can have some separation uh, between the non-equilibrium mechanism that corrects error and the uh, discriminating part of the reaction. But of course, it's not the only possibility. So the, the error correction mechanism can be much more complicated and indeed, nowadays, we know much more about this reaction. So in particular, in the case of translation, uh, there is a lot of research in trying to really dissect each step of the reaction and see and try to measure what the rates are. And uh, um, just to give you an idea, I show you a figure from a review from about 10 years ago um, in which they try to summarize the state of the art of the different steps in uh, in protein translation. So these are these two lines are essentially the different steps that occur from the initial incorporation until uh, the final stage in which the um, incorporation is confirmed. And what do I want to focus your attention on is um, also here the arrows of different colors. So the red arrows uh, represent reactions that occur faster so the higher rate for wrong monomers and the green arrows are reactions that occur faster for right monomers. So here you have after an initial step that is insensitive to the kind of monomer, a step that discriminates backward. So tends to um, remove um, wrong monomers faster than right monomers. Then you have uh, the irreversible step, which is where GTP is a uh, consumed, uh, well, it started to be is activated actually. And this step has a forward rate, which is faster for right monomers. This is then followed by hydrolysis. And finally, there is a step in which the wrong monomer can be rejected at a higher rate and the right monomer is incorporated at a higher rate. So you can see that there is a, um, 
uh, non-trivial combination of different steps and in some of them there is forward discrimination in some other there is backward discrimination and of course you can ask why uh, nature evolved this reaction in this way rather than any other possibility and you can also start think uh, about this question a bit more in general not necessarily related uh, to translation so the way i like to somehow think about this problem in an abstract way is to think that uh, if you can imagine that there is a template that for simplicity has two different kind of monomers and there is a machine that is trying to reproduce this template so create another one that has the same exact order of uh, monomers but of course at given a final temperature this machine can uh, make errors so clearly um, good properties for this machine would be to have a high accuracy meaning a low error rate um, low dissipation because of course you don't want to spend too much energy uh, this is costly for the cell in principle and uh, you want to perform this operation at high velocity because um, both duplicating dna and uh, producing proteins at high velocity would improve the cell fitness and so the question is how do you design a network that has all this property and if is there a physical limit to, to how i can opti how much i can optimize this so this is somehow the long I, I feel this is the long term question of this field i won't say uh, that much about the general optimality but i will tell you some ideas about simple network that can suggest something about how things should work um, so this is a really uh, this was my introduction now i'll go to the outline of um, the results i will present so i will start discussing about the simplest case in which this reaction occurs in single steps so there are no multi-step reactions but we'll see that also in this case there are some non-trivial results that are worth discussing uh, then I'll discuss some more general reaction, some multi-step reactions in which um, proofreading is included. And I will also uh, try to analyze these uh, systems uh, in the spirit of stochastic thermodynamics, so by computing um, entropy production, the entropy production rate and use it to uh, derive bounds on, uh, between velocity, accuracy, and uh, um, dissipation of these uh, systems. And finally, I will talk about some more recent uh, um, results that we uh, derived last year, really, about um, generalizing all of this to the fluctuating case. Okay, so um, the first work is really inspired by a paper by Charles Bennett that uh, came uh, shortly after Hopfield paper and uh, was interested in uh, uh, looking at um, really the energetics of proofreading and error correction so the um, bennett model uh, you can think of it as uh, the steady state version of um, a copy model so instead of having considering incorporation of a single monomer and then the reaction finishes you you are thinking about copying an infinitely long polymer as i was um, introducing before so if you think about my example if um, incorporation and misincorporation because you want everything to be thermodynamically reversible um, of monomers of course in single step then uh, the whole uh, um, state space or transition network of the system is an infinite tree so you have if, if you see this figure i don't have my pointer but um, so the transition network they're showing on the left in the beginning you have a state in which uh, the copy is empty and the first monomer you can uh, incorporate might be a right or a wrong uh, match with the template and after that you can incorporate another right and another wrong and so on and so forth so you have this infinite tree of possibilities corresponding to any possible sequence in the copy and um, so this is uh, Bennett's model and uh, at this point we have to make a statement about the choice of these rates so there are four rates incorporation and misincorporation of right monomers incorporation and misincorporation of wrong monomers and um, again in the spirit of stochastic thermodynamics it's um, useful to think of these rates in terms of an energy landscape so you can see the energy landscape on the right of the slide 
so zero represent a state before uh, any incorporation because the network is the same everywhere so all the states are the same and uh, w and right are the states after incorporating a wrong or a right monomer from this reference state and you can see, uh, see that i can describe this energy landscape in terms of uh, three parameters so this gamma represents the difference in incorporation energy between a wrong and a right monomer delta represents the difference in activation barriers between these two monomers and epsilon you can think of it as a driving so if epsilon is large then the reaction is uh, strongly out of equilibrium and forward rates are large compared to backward rates it turns out that since this network has uh, no loop you can always solve this model so there is a um, general equation for the error rate which is this equation in the box so the and you can think of it as a sort of self-consistent equation so the fraction of errors which is eta is proportional to the net incorporation rate of error which is the forward rate of wrong monomers minus the backward rate of wrong monomers multiplied by the error rate so this is a sort of self-consistent equation and you can say the same for a right monomer and by taking the ratio you get the equation which is uh, from, from which you can compute the error rate exactly. Um, but instead of looking at the general expression, I think it's uh, more illuminating to look at uh, limiting cases. So um, there are two limiting cases that are interesting. One is the equilibrium limit, so in which epsilon is uh, driving is very small. Uh, and in this case, uh, we already knew from what we discussed before that the error rate must be given by the um, the Boltzmann factor, so e to the minus uh, gamma in this case, which is the free energy difference between wrong and right monomer. And in, in all of this, I'm taking, uh, uh, I'm working in dimensionless units, so beta is equal to one here. Sorry, Simone, there is a question uh, in the chat, so it's the following. Oh, it's like, yeah, I can't see the chat, sorry. Yeah, no, okay, please. okay. You cannot see it, okay, so I tell you. Uh, uh, I'm not oh, sure what it is. Yeah, sorry, uh, uh, I can repeat the question. Uh, I, I thought please go ahead. I just wanted to ask, uh, basically the delta G's also depend on the concentrations, so, so do you assume that the right and wrong monomers are the same concentration? Uh, you, you can do either. I mean, uh, you can think of it as equal concentration, or you can think that uh, there is a chemical potential and that enters these rates. So if, uh, yeah. Um, Normally, we think for simplicity equal concentration, but essentially, um, if you have a, a case with unequal concentration, then you can somehow effectively incorporate into this delta G. So these are really, uh, yeah, free energy, um, Gibbs free energy. So, okay. yeah, thanks. It, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. So um, the other limit I was mentioning is uh, the limit of um, a fully irreversible process, so very large uh, epsilon. And in this case, um, only the forward rates matter. And we know that the forward rates are dictated by the energy barrier. So in this case, you can easily compute that the error is e to the minus delta. So the, the difference in activation barriers between right and wrong monomers. And of course, by increasing epsilon, I interpolate between these two limits. But the interesting aspect of this model is that, of course, e to the minus delta can be either larger or smaller than e to the minus gamma. So depending on the choice of these two parameters, you can have a case in which by increasing the driving and pushing the reaction out of equilibrium, of course, the velocity always increases, as you can see in these plots, but um, the error can increase or decrease depending on whether delta is larger or smaller than gamma. Does that make sense? So you have an error rate which is um, dictated by the barriers, another that is dictated by the energy difference. And uh, if the error, the say kinetic error, is smaller, than the equilibrium error, then you, you will get a higher accuracy by driving the reaction faster. And if the equilibrium error is smaller than the kinetic error, then you will get a better accuracy by slowing down the reaction. 
So to summarize this result, you can think of it uh, uh, in parameter space. And uh, from the solution of the model, you can uh, um, look at it in another way. So imagine that I fix the error and I look at the values of the parameters that will be compatible with this value, this fixed value of the error. And what you will find is that is, um, this region is uh, um, given by this inequality that is in the box and it's also represented in this phase plot that you can see. So you can see that there are two uh, color disjoint regions, which are the regions that are compatible with a given value of the error rate. So the white regions are region where that given error is impossible. There is no value of the driving that will give you that error. And uh, so if you are in the green region and if you want to reduce the error, you need to increase the driving. And this will imply a higher dissipation, but also higher velocity. So there's always a trade-off. Whereas in the energetic region, if you want to reduce the error, you need to slow down the reaction, which means you will pay less price in terms of entropy, but also slow down the reaction. So this, this will be two opposite trade-offs. And uh, to see whether um, biology will choose one over the other, we looked at the rates of um, incorporation of monomers from two DNA polymerase, one uh, uh, which is pol gamma, which is used in a lot of eukaryotes and higher organisms, and one from the phage T7. And we found that the rates, um, these two polymerases, if you remove profiling, have a pretty similar error rate, but they will correspond to two different regions in this plot. So this is somehow a proof of principle that um, biology probably uses both these strategies for different organisms. Um, so, of course, we are very happy with this. Um, Sorry, uh, Simon. Do yeah. you have, yeah. Do you have a, an intuition or a story of why they are in, uh, in the respective region? Uh, no, and honestly, I would have expected the opposite because I would have said that uh, phages wouldn't care about the error and they would only care about reproducing faster. So this is a bit surprising to me. Yeah, that's I don't... why I asked the question. Okay. Yeah, I would have, uh, yeah. Of course, once you see the result, you can always find a justification, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I like to be honest and say that, you know, if, I, if you ask me before I saw the, the numbers, I would have expected the opposite. So I, I don't want to overinterpret this and uh, I guess maybe one can make a hypothesis but I, I, I don't have it that clear really. Um, right so of course um, after we, we saw this result we try to think about um, a bit more in general um, how can more complex reactions combine these two modes so the, this um, more forward genetic discrimination and backward energetic discrimination. So we started thinking about a more general model and the idea is to generalize it by thinking that still you have this tree of possibilities corresponding to any possible sequence in the copy, but now each incorporation is not a single step, but can in general occur by an arbitrary network of reactions. And what we have in mind is that uh, this network is the same for right and wrong monomers, but it might have different rates. So the rates are parameterized as usual in stochastic thermodynamics. So you can see the formula you probably is very familiar. So um, this is essentially what people call a, a generalized detail balance or microscopic detail balance. So uh, each state inside this network has an energy um, and there is a time scale associated with each transition. Of course, the energy of each internal state might be different uh, depending on whether the monomer is a right or a wrong one. And each of these network can be driven by a chemical driving, which is this parameter new. Um, so, of course, this is completely general, but there are not so many general things um, that we can say about this general model. There are though a few things. So, first of all, uh, it is possible to um, do a similar game for some simple example. So, one case is kinetic proofreading which is uh, somehow the polymerization version of Hopfield model in which uh, there is an intermediate state and a second state from which you can discard um, the, uh, the incorporated monomer. And what we found is that if you try to minimize the 
uh, error respect to the all the possible driving then there are um, two regions in this case so one is in a region in which um, we, we call the kinetic lock in which essentially the error of the coping reaction is determined by the first barrier so the kinetic activation barrier of the first reaction and this is further corrected by the proofreading reaction and the second is uh, something which is resemblant to what is called the induced fit in the uh, enzymatic literature so in this case uh, the reaction um, the first step is low so the reaction can use in an energetic way the first reaction it can use the barrier of the second reaction and this is again corrected by the proofreading mechanism so we did also simulation and we show that indeed you have these two different regions in which the behavior depends in different ways from the different parameters of the reaction but of course this direct solution is something you can do in this case but you can't really uh, do the minimization for very large systems um, so the other thing you can do is to try to um, derive more general um, constraints based on physical principles so one thing that you can do is to um, write the second law of stochastic thermodynamics or write the explicit expression for the dissipation and you know that on average this might be uh, greater or equal than zero and uh, for this general model you can do this exactly and what you will find is that um, the entropy production per step which is the entropy average entropy production rate divided the uh, velocity of the reaction uh, this is um, this can be expressed uh, uh, in terms of three different terms so one is the um, average work performed every time a monomer is incorporated a second term is an equilibrium free energy difference so the equilibrium free energy of each incorporated monomer and then there is a third term which um, is related to information which is given by the um, kullback leibler distance between the binary distribution of the error uh, and uh, the equilibrium error so this is eta log eta time divided eta equilibrium plus y minus eta and so on so this is a um, an interesting expression for a couple of reasons so one is uh, that it tells you that uh, if you want to achieve a given value of the error which is lower than the equilibrium error there is a this dictates a finite dissipation rate so the amount of dissipation you need is greater is not only greater than zero but it's greater than a finite constant that you can write down because and this is due to the fact that the, the kullback leibler distance is positive um, and uh, the second thing is the interpretation of this in terms of um, information thermodynamics and the idea is that if you generate a polymer that has a more order structure than a random polymer um, this is something you can extract work from so there is a, a free energy in the incorporation of the monomer which is the classical uh, equilibrium free energy but there is also a free energy content due to the fact that the, um, this entire copy polymer is not a random string and uh, this is something essentially you can fit to a maxwell demon and extract work out of it and of course since you can extract work from this order sequence you need to perform work to create this order sequence so this is this is a way you can look at this result um, however uh, i have to say that in practical terms this is not really a very useful bound because the um if you start uh, looking at uh, realistic reactions in which you have proofreading typically the dissipation is way larger than the kullback library distance between the error and the equilibrium error so this is not really a good bound for complex reactions but using uh, similar uh, um, approaches you can for example look at the dissipation of only the proofreading reaction because also if you have subnetworks this um, must uh, satisfy some inequalities and for example you can write uh, another inequality in which um, um, that states that the, the error is must be greater than the equilibrium error times a factor, factor which includes the free energy difference 
and the work spent in the proofreading reaction. And this is actually a much better bound. So you can see that um, if you start, uh, um, this is for a, for a model which is similar to the upfield model. And if you start including, uh, um, increasing the proofreading work, you find that this bound is very is a very good prediction of the actual minimum error of this reaction in a broad range of, um, of parameters, values of the parameters. <clears throat> um, so yeah, uh, there are uh, other aspects of this that are um, interesting. And um, so some, one th something that we wanted to really understand is um, the issue of velocity error trade-offs. And here, since also you are interested in codon bias, you told me, um, I like to cite this paper that I find quite interesting. So it seems like in, in a complex reaction, like um, in, uh, in protein translation, you tend to have a negative trade-off between velocity and accuracy. So this is similar to the um, energetic um, discrimination that I described before. And, um, and this kind of uh, um, trade-off has been ex extensively tested experimentally. So this is a, a relatively recent paper from Ehrenberg Group in which they really saw this trade-off in vitro for different codons. So of course, it, it different codons have different rates. So the, the slope of this trade-off is different, uh, but um, this seems to be uh, general. Um, Okay, so now I'll tell you a bit about uh, some more recent work. So something that we try to do, which I think it's quite interesting, is to think um, since these complex re reactions are always... Well, yes? Can you go back? Uh, and uh, so what are the different colors in this uh, figure? Different codons. So we have, oh, okay. uh, we have polymers with, with always like uh, repeated the, the same codons and, and you look at... Uh, uh, the trade-off per codon. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So okay. this is, I find the interesting uh, information. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we have been thinking about different approaches mm -hmm. to this problem. So one is, uh, um, what if instead of having uh, reactions with discrete step, we think about a continuous reaction? Uh, so normally, this is actually pretty common in chemistry, especially when it is possible to study reactions with um, some kind of molecular dynamics. So one has a, an idea of the continuous energy landscape of the reaction. And so our idea is that uh, we can think of incorporation of right and wrong monomer as some kind of one dimensional um, reaction coordinate that evolves along uh, a free energy landscape, which in this case is continuous. And of course, uh, the delicate point is that one needs to so one would have a Langevin dynamics on each branch, but then the delicate point is how to treat the branching point. So then you need to figure out what are the um, boundary conditions associated with these Langevin equations. But this is something that you can do and you can use this uh, framework uh, to uh, ask other questions. For example, you can have a situation in which there is a um, kinetic discrimination, but not only you have a difference in height of the activation barrier, but the width of the activation barrier is different. And uh, you can find out that it is possible, for example, to discriminate by having uh, broader barriers instead of narrower barriers. So this extends a bit um, our understanding of how these um, forms of discriminations work. Oh, sorry, I have a question. So yeah. in uh, this model in Langevin, it's like you have a particle in the, in the blue free energy, in the beam, yeah. and suddenly you switch to the red free energy, or 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 you yeah, switch yeah. To, to the zero yeah, position. When you, when you reach when you reach the boundary, uh -huh. uh, you you take one branch or the other with certain probabilities. Ah, okay, okay. So, and so there you, are some. Uh, you need to figure out what are the probabilities uh, according to. So, so, so it's like a first passage problem, no? So you you wait until yeah. you cross the barrier in one, and then you appear. Either in the blue yeah. or in the red. Correct. Okay. Correct. Ah, yeah. very nice. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the last thing I want to tell you is uh, this issue. So um, well, something that uh, this is something actually we have been discussed for a while with uh, uh, Yuhai too, that also worked uh, with us on this project. 
and the issue is that um, pretty much everything we have seen on this topic is not really stochastic in the sense that essentially what we have been doing and other people have been doing uh, is solving um, you can think of them as master equations but you can also think of them as stoichiometric equations so in, in some sense there's not nothing um, intrinsically related to the fact that we are dealing with uh, something that occurs at low in low numbers and we have been thinking for a while is there something interesting some problems that can be related to the fact that we are thinking about really a microscopic problem and we ended up also with one of my postdocs david qq to think about the following problem so imagine that you have again the same situation as before so you have a uh, an enzyme that needs to replicate um, a given polymer and um, you perform this process a given number of times finite number of times but this time i'm not thinking about the infinite limit i'm thinking about a finite time so i give to this enzyme um, a fixed time and then the enzyme is stopped the reaction is stopped and i repeat this process or i do it in parallel if you want and so i will end up with the different copy polymers that will have um, different lengths and different number of errors and now what i'm asking is um, are the error fractions and the length of the copied polymers correlated so in this case the error fraction is an empirical error fraction it's not the theoretical again before everything was we were solving the steady state equation and we were getting uh, the average error fraction for an infinite uh, polymer but here you have a finite time and you're looking at the empirical error fraction and the empirical length and you want to know whether these are correlated or not um, there is a, an alternative problem that is also, I think, interesting, which is the fixed length case. And this is actually very um, relevant for biology because you can think that you have to copy one gene. So the gene has a finite length, it's not infinite. And also in this case, you can think that if you repeat this process many, many times, uh, every time it will, the, the time it will take to replicate the gene is a stochastic quantity. And the number of errors on the gene is also stochastic quantity. And again, you can ask, are these two things correlated or not? And of course, if I'm telling you about this, obviously the answer is yes, they are in general correlated quantities. Uh, so again, I'm not, I'm not telling you exactly what is the model here because now we will discuss this problem in general. Uh, but if you have a, a specific model for how uh, monomers are incorporated and error are incorporated, you can find that um, if you repeat this process many, many times, in the first scenario, at fixed time, you can observe indeed um, significant correlations between the length of the copy and its error fraction. And uh, also in the fixed length scenario, you can find significant correlation between uh, error fraction and time um, so something that i like of this thing compared to the usual um, idea of trade-offs is that this is really something intrinsic of the process so in the experiments where you look at say trade-offs between velocity and error you observe the trade-off by varying something in the experiment so in, in the case of the experiments i showed before What's varied is the concentration of uh, magnesium ions that essentially speed up or slow down the reactions. Whereas here, essentially, you're not uh, touching any external parameter. This is something you're really looking at the uh, steady state fluctuations of this process. Um, to understand what's going on, so the first thing that we could show is that um the fixed time and fixed length scenario are related with each other and in fact you can think of them as two different ensembles um essentially this is something you can show in different ways one one possibility is to use large deviation theory but um the bottom line is that uh, the most natural way of characterizing this correlation is by a correlation coefficient so looking at the 
uh, covariance between error and time divided the uh, standard deviation of error times the standard deviation of time and similar for the length error um, correlation. And uh, if the model is the same, what you will find is that uh, um, these two correlation coefficients are the same with a, with a different sign. And um, to prove that these are simulations of two different uh, kind of incorporation networks that you see in the plot uh, with random rates and for each value of the rates, uh, we plotted the, the correlation coefficient in the two different cases and you can see that they fall perfectly on the, on the straight line. So essentially, these are really two equivalent ensembles and there is no need to study them both. So for, from now on, I'll just talk about the first case, about the fixed time case, because it's simpler to treat analytically. Um, so to understand what's going on here, we um, decided to work with a slightly simpler model. And the simplification here is that we assume that the last incorporation network is, uh, incorporation reaction is fully reversible. So this uh, makes everything simpler because uh, I cannot go back. So once a monomer is incorporated, it's incorporated forever. And in this case, I don't even need to think about the entire network. I can think of it as a binary process in which um, errors are uh, incorporated with an a priori probability eta zero and right monomers are incorporated with an a priori probability one minus eta zero. And the important thing is that these two processes might take different time. So there is a probability distribution of the time it will take to incorporate a wrong monomer and another probability distribution, uh, which is the time to incorporate the right monomer. And these two are arbitrary. So if I, if I use this model, then uh, I can easily um, write down the probability of having incorporated a given number of right and wrong monomer at a given time. So this is a sort of path probability and um, it's a maybe lengthy expression, but it, it should be quite um, reasonable. So you have in the beginning a binomial factor, which takes into account the different ways in which I can arrange these right and wrong monomers. And then uh, uh, the integral term takes into account that uh, the sum of incorporation times, so the um, you have um, r variables tau i distributed from the distribution of right monomers and the number of variables from the distribution of times to incorporate the wrong monomers in connect to the number of wrong monomers. And the sum over all these variables must be equal to the total time that I'm fixing. Um, so by playing with expressions and taking the uh, limit in which the time is large but is not infinite, what you can find is that uh, uh, the correlation coefficient can be approximated by this expression. So it's um, essentially uh, proportional to the difference in the average incorporation condition incorporation time between right and wrong monomer times the square root of the error rate divided the, the variance of the incorporation, the distribution incorporation time of right monomers. And uh, the way you can think about this result is essentially uh, if the time it takes to incorporate right monomers is longer than the time it takes to incorporate wrong monomers, then of course you would expect that, uh, um, so this, this essentially will generate a correlation because in, the fi in a finite time, um, there will be a different probability of incorporating a number of right and wrong monomers. So if, if effectively this integral is correlating the fraction of errors and, um, and the length of the copy. Um, so what else did I want to say here? So another thing that I want to stress is that these are uh, conditional probability. In fact, the interesting uh, aspect of this model, and this is something that convinced us for a while that there was no effect whatsoever, is that if you take these distributions to be exponential, then the correlation coefficient is zero. Because essentially, uh, you don't have really a difference in the, um, in the expected correlation time, in the, conditioned correlation, in the conditioned time between right and wrong monomers. 
So you can observe an effect only if these distributions are not exponential. Essentially, due to the fact that the exponential distribution is memoryless. Um, so let me uh, show you a few examples. So again, one example is the Hopfield model. And in this case, uh, where the, this correlation coefficient is positive, and uh, by uh, playing with the parameters of the model and using this theory, we could find found uh, a bound on the intensity of this correlation. So for small errors, this correlation scale like the square root of the error rate, the, the, the magnitude of the correlation coefficient. We also uh, looked at a model of protein translation, which is similar to the um, proof model, but there is a step which incorporates forward discrimination, as we discussed before. And we found, uh, in this case, uh, an approximated expression for the correlation coefficient. And interestingly, in this case, uh, the sign is the opposite. So this is a case in which there is a negative correlation between the error and the length of the generated polymer. So again, uh, this is uh, an approximated expression, but um, it seems to work pretty well with simulations. And also, if we uh, compute the value, the expected value of this coefficient from measured parameters, uh, from the measured rates in, uh, in different uh, strains of E. coli, as you can see in the figure. So this is a nice, uh, I find it a nice result because essentially uh, just the sign of this coefficient tells you something on whether there are uh, forward discrimination reactions or not in uh, in your network and this is just it doesn't need to uh, does not require uh, any tuning of external parameters uh, so i'll um, reach my conclusion so in the first part of my talk i'll tell you i told you a bit about simple reaction in which um, incorporation of monomers occur in a single step and i showed you that in this case one can distinguish between um, kinetic discrimination and energetic discrimination um, the idea of this strategy survives if one studies more complex schemes, but things become suddenly and quickly more complicated. And it's, uh, it's not so easy to extract general rules for arbitrary large networks. Uh, another approach is to use um, stochastic thermodynamics and the fact that the second law of thermodynamics always must hold to derive bounds on uh, speed, accuracy, and dissipation of these reactions. And finally, um, I showed you this recent result that um, uh, for which um, the kind of discrimination schemes can be identified by looking at correlations, uh, steady state correlations between error and speed. And um, yeah, I conclude by thanking uh, my collaborators. So this is actually a, a relatively old uh, picture of my group at toys because Due to social distancing, we cannot take one this year. But uh, the person in circle is Davide, that did uh, most of the work that I presented in the second part. And I will also acknowledge uh, my collaborators, Pablo Sartori, that uh, is now group leader in Lisbon, uh, who collaborated with me on the first part of this project, and Yuhai, too, that also worked on this last project. And finally, my funding sources. And thanks. Ciao Simone, <laughs> so I send you a virtual clap <laughs> in the name of everyone. <laughs> so I leave the stage for questions. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so I, I'm a bit puzzled by the, this positive correlation between the error rate and length uh, when you do with a finite time. So um, can, can you, ex because say you would imagine that, uh, well, Naively, if you have a certain probability, I mean, especially in this case, you were saying that uh, the waiting time for uh, um, uh, uh, so the average waiting time for uh, doing mistakes is uh, smaller than the average waiting time for uh, doing uh, the. Uh, Sorry, did you no. expect it to be positive or negative? 
No, no, I find it, uh, I find it uh, strange that uh, in the case of the OPFIL model, uh, where there is proofreading, uh, there is a positive correlation. So ca can you explain uh, a little bit better why, why it is so? I can try. So this is also has been a bit of a, a puzzle for me. Like it took me a while to wrap my hand around this result. So naively, I was thinking um, if you have proofreading, you discard wrong monomers. So this, you know, you have this process in which you start incorporating, then you throw them off, then you start incorporating. So that takes a lot of time. But this argument does not work because when you discard, when you somehow um, yeah, discard the reaction, you don't necessarily start incorporating a wrong monomer again. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the proofreading reaction brings you back to, back to square one, right? Mm -hmm. And from yeah. there, you don't necessarily start again the wrong reaction. So this has a, so uh -huh. you have somehow loops okay. in which you start, uh, you see what I mean? So the, the proofreading reaction is neutral with respect to whether uh, um, uh, to, to is neutral with respect to this correlation. Uh, I wouldn't say it's neutral because it changes the shape of these distributions. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so it affects these times, but um, it's not. It's not simply slowing down the wrong incorporation pathway. It, it has a complex uh, effect on both. So essentially in the Hopfin model, you have uh, the average waiting time uh, for uh, uh, incorporating the wrong monomer is larger than the one uh, to incorporate the yeah. right one. Okay, I see. No, sorry, the right is larger than the wrong. Uh, the right is larger than the wrong. Okay. Yeah. Isn't, isn't this continuing to it? It is. <laughs> because can you go back to the formula? Uh, this one or this one? Uh, the previous one. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, am I saying this one? This one. It's correct. It's correct. It's very interesting. So, can you give uh, an idea? Let, of... let me let me maybe try to um, give you an argument, which for me it works. I don't know if it's um, good enough for YouTube, but uh, so um, if you have proofreading, you have that very likely uh, when you are at the say last step and you have the wrong monomer this is uh, the reaction is restarted which means that uh, the wrong monomers that are incorporated actually spend a very short time in the last step so this is selecting uh, fluctuations in which you really go through the network very quickly mm -hmm. So if a wrong monomer spends a lot of time in the last step, it will be uh, reset. Okay. Would that make sense? I think so. I mean, that, that's, that's the way, I, that's my intuition. I don't know if it's... <laughs> Can you give an idea of how you derive this last bound that you put there? Is all last deviation bounds or, or isn't there any shortcut to this derivation? Uh, we use mostly large deviation. Uh, it's not really large deviation because in the end it's, um, um, we are looking at correlations. So it's really mm -hmm. the first correction around the average value. Mm -hmm. But uh, for example, for the equivalents, um, it was more convenient to work with the large deviations because, yeah. Right. Um, other questions? I think Rami wants to yes, say something. Uh, so I, I'm curious about the, the protein translation model. Uh, and I wonder if you can estimate wh uh, what is, uh, Nikolai, what is the fraction of energy that is going to specifically to error correction in, in the process? 
Is it is it twenty five percent or more? Uh, what do you mean the fraction of energy? Fraction of uh, which energy? Well, like I wonder. I understand that you have to you have to spend some energy in order to do error correction, but. Uh, yeah. But is it important in the global picture? I mean, how, how much of the energy that you have to invest in order to translate goes specifically to error correction? Um, I'm not sure you can really, it's not obvious to me whether you can really ask that question in the sense that, of course, ribosomes consume a lot of energy. And I'm not sure how easy it is to make a statement of which fraction of this energy is error correction because it's the same reaction it's not you see what i mean yeah i mean i understand it's how to separate it because it's uh, like a it's a whole network basically some of the reactions are there for uh, translocation and others are for well yeah i, I understand what you mean Maybe, it's not clear so the, what i mean it's it's pretty clear that the, uh, there are some constraints on the error and there are some constraints on the velocity like if you have slow ribosomes then you cannot have a high fitness and of course yeah. the same network achieves i mean the same reaction achieves high velocity achieves the dissipation which is whatever it is and achieves low error so uh, is you can't say i mean the same energy budget performs all the reaction that has all these properties. So I'm not sure I wish is to say, this is the energy budget for error correction. This is the error budget to make the ribosome run yeah, fast. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more complicated than I thought. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, interesting. Other questions? Are you from students? We're very silent. I don't see any, so it's also late in Japan, so I would say maybe we, we close the session. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Simone, for the great talk. Thanks.